So let's get on it. Dr. Great. Dickinson is from Harvard and you're a dementia expert. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be part of the group here. And um, I don't know, uh, I, I would be happy to spend about 30 minutes doing what is most helpful to everyone. Um, I prepared a few slides, but I don't have to go through those. I'm happy to just talk or whatever would be most helpful and of interest to people. So um, let me know what you think about that. I think that if you just want to like maybe refer to your slides and just talk about PCA, talk about what you do. And sure. then after that, we'll take questions. Yeah, that sounds great. So uh, we have evolved our thinking uh, a little bit over the last few years because we've been working with people with uh, PCA for about 10 plus years or so. And um, uh, I think the, the, the way I think about it now is uh, when, we, when, we t when we think about assessing people, evaluating people, um, many people with posterior cortical atrophy uh, have uh, a few years where they have some gradual, gradually developing difficulty with vision uh, of various types. Some people uh, have trouble seeing and understanding other people's faces, or, or, uh, but usually it's more uh, like reading. Uh, and, it, and it often involves some of the sense of space uh, or sense of direction. And so reading is often an early thing that's effective because it requires both uh, complicated visual function and um, uh, being able to stay on the line of the, of the page uh, or the line of the uh, you know, print as you're reading. So um, what we usually do is we um, take a history from a person and find out um, whether they how the problems have what the problems are that they're experiencing and how those problems have affected their functioning um, and this is sort of what we do more broadly in general when patients have a variety of kinds of things whether they're related to pca or related to one of the other uh you know presentations that that, that people come to us with in terms of the kinds of symptoms they're having and so um, we go through uh, an interview with, with people and they report on uh, issues of this sort. For example, there's a woman that we're working with right now who um, has had to, decided to give up driving because she felt like she couldn't uh, pay attention to and keep track of all the things that she, that she had to look at when she was driving. And she moved to an assisted living community because she was having some trouble managing um, her stuff and her medications because it was just tough to see things clearly. But she is quite capable of uh, sitting with us today and engaging in a high level discussion about what's going on with her. And as we talked with her, we figured out that uh, she also had trouble seeing, uh, knowing who people were from looking at their face. Uh, and so the, the way we're thinking about it now in general is that um, when you take information in from your eyes to your brain, it goes, and I think this has been discussed some in this forum before, but it goes back to the occipital lobe in the back of the brain, and some of it goes down into the temporal lobe, uh, and what that does is help you understand what objects are that you're looking at, uh, including uh, specific objects like faces, and who those people are that, are, that you're looking at. Um, and so this woman has trouble with that, um, because she can look at someone and just, I don't, it's hard to imagine what she's seeing, but she doesn't see what we think of as a, an identifiable face. And so I took a picture of her and our speech pathologist and her son and a couple other people in our office at the time and mixed them up and I showed them to her and she could not tell one from the other. When I showed her a picture of herself, she thought it was our speech pathologist. So, uh, but then when the person speaks to her, she knows exactly who they are or sometimes when uh, she sees them walking, she can tell exactly who they are. So it's a very specific uh, problem accessing uh, her knowledge of, of people by looking at their face. Um, and so that's a specific problem that we think of as part of the, uh, what's called the what system uh, that I, helps us identify what things are when you look at them. The other problem she's having is a, pro a, 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 a problem that's common to PCA, which is uh, part of the where system. So if the information comes into the occipital lobe in the back of the brain, 
and some of it goes down and some of it goes up. The up uh, is the wear system. So that helps us know where things are in space. And so, you know, when we're reaching for our coffee cup or whatever, um, you know, our brain just automatically processes where it's located. And, you know, you could be looking at something else, reading a paper or whatever, and reach over because you kind of know where the coffee cup is in space and you don't really need to look at it in order to grab it and pick it up and bring it to your mouth. So that's really uh, involved, involves the wear system. And that's where people often get lost in space, as it were, um, having trouble finding their way around or having trouble positioning their body in relationship to a chair or having trouble with directions or having trouble with uh, where things are in space. So she has some difficulty with that as well. Um, and, and so that's the profile of her symptoms is mainly a visual and a spatial profile of symptoms. Uh, consistent with what we think of as posterior cortical atrophy. And it's compromised her functioning, you know, in specific ways, but she's capable of functioning at a high level in many other ways. So we think of her in general as having a form of what we call mild cognitive impairment. So what we usually do is we start with the overall uh, functioning of the person and we say, is this person essentially independent except for a few specific things that they might have trouble with because of certain kinds of visual trouble. If that's the case, we say they have a type of mild cognitive impairment because they've got mild cognitive impairment, but it's not really impacting their independent functioning substantially. If they have lost independent functioning substantially, and again, this is very personalized, this is very um, you know, unique to each individual in terms of what their functioning had been before, then we often will, you know, classify that loss of function as a, as a mild form of dementia from just using the conventional terminology in the field. Uh, so the first thing we do when we evaluate someone is try to figure out how they're, how, in what ways and to what degree their function has been compromised. And then we get into this thing that we call the clinical syndrome, which is really the flavor of the symptoms that I was just describing in the woman that we've worked with. Uh, and that's, uh, that clinical syndrome then gets mapped onto these diagnostic criteria, for example, PCA. Um, in another person with a whole different set of symptoms, they might have mainly a language problem, and uh, their syndrome might be considered PPA, primary progressive aphasia. So there are these acronyms that basically sort of capture in shorthand what the person's symptoms are. Uh, and so, so we, we think of sort of three levels of assessment. The first is that overall level of functioning. The second is what the specific syndrome is that the person is experiencing. And sometimes that maps directly onto one of these conditions that we have names for. And sometimes it doesn't really map onto uh, a named condition. And then the third level is we want to understand what the brain disease is in the person's brain that is causing them to have these symptoms. And so that's where all the imaging and other evaluation comes in. And generally speaking, with posterior cortical atrophy, most patients will have an MRI and will, um, there will be evidence of, of atrophy or shrinkage in the back of the brain. And basically, that's often how far the di you know, how much is done before the diagnosis is made. Now, in our current thinking, what we really want to know is what are the um, molecular problems in the brain? if we can identify them, that we think ultimately is a reflection of the pathology in the brain that's causing the problem. And even though statistically we know that most people with PCA, the pathology is an, uh, an atypical uh, form of Alzheimer's disease in the brain, I think part of why I'm talking about this in this much detail is that we're trying now, more and more we're trying to separate the clinical syndrome and, and the you know, level of functional impairment that it's caused from the disease in the brain, uh, because uh, it used to be and still is the case that many people will just lump all that together under the rubric of Alzheimer's disease. And, and I don't think that's a, a, so useful because even though it's a shorthand for many people, it doesn't really tell you what the person's symptoms are and what their needs might be and what their strengths might be that they could draw on to try to compensate for the problems they're having. So. Uh, in our research, and also as much as we can in our clinical practice, we're trying to um, measure through brain imaging with PET scans or through spinal fluid, we're trying to determine whether a person with PCA has uh, evidence of amyloid plaques uh, and tau tangles 
that would support the idea that their PCA is likely due to underlying Alzheimer's disease in the brain. In maybe 10, 15% of people, uh, it's not. So it, it probably is in somewhere around, depending on how strict your definitions are with these things, um, 75 to 85% of people with PCA have their condition because of an unusual form of Alzheimer's disease in their brain that's causing the atrophy in the back of the brain. But we know that at least 10, 15, maybe, you know, it's hard to be sure of these numbers, but a, a minority of that size have a different neurodegenerative disease that is causing their symptoms. And right now, uh, that may not really matter that much uh, in terms of treatment, um, but someday it's going to influence, and, and in some cases now, it influences at least um, what drug trials we suggest that people at least try to get involved in. Uh, because if the person does not have evidence of amyloid plaques in the brain, then they very likely don't have uh, PCA due to Alzheimer's, and therefore there's no point in trying to get into one of the drug trials that's trying to see if it can treat amyloid plaques in the brain as part of slowing down the progression of Alzheimer's, whatever form it may take. So I think, you know, for me, if, if I'm advising a person with PCA about, um, you know, how to get sort of the diagnosis confirmed, that's some of the, of what I talk about, because, you know, I think that if a person with PCA has amyloid in their brain, it may be possible for them to get into one of the clinical trials um, uh, to try to treat that. Many of those clinical trials won't take people with PCA because they um, don't have the kinds of symptoms that are required for those trials because they're mainly targeted toward measuring whether it helps with memory or some of the more typical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So it may not you know, work for other reasons, but at least um, we like to try. And then the other thing we try to do is just uh, help people anticipate as much as possible um, you know, how to monitor the condition over time and, and what to um, imagine might happen, you know, in the future. And I think that's done, it's, 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 we can be more confident in the ways we advise people if we think we have an idea of whether it's likely Alzheimer's in the brain or not. So, and I'll just stop there for now, maybe, because I would be happy also to talk more about how we try to help uh, personalize the care plan for people with PCA, but but just in terms of thinking about how we diagnose it and, and how I think about it from that perspective, maybe it's worth having a little bit of a conversation. I can't, I can't hear you. Okay. I, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Could you talk about what, the, you're talking about stages. So what I've been noticing from the, the very different types of, of people and they're they're talking about their symptoms. How I mean, why first of all, the question is, you know, why do some people have visual dementia as opposed to other types of dementia? I don't know if you if if the research has gotten there yet. And then secondly, how does it progress? I mean, you know what I mean? Like and and does it is it always the same in everybody? Because it seems like they're the symptoms are so variable. Right. Yeah, those are great, great questions. I think, um, you know, it, it, the, the simple um, way to think about it is, to start with anyway, is that um, unfortunately, everybody I have worked with, with PCA, eventually develops what would be, you know, usually referred to as dementia, um, where they've really lost other cognitive functions as well. And the question that you're asking really is, you know, why is it that some people, uh, as they progress into a condition that doesn't, that affects more than just vision, why is it that some people have a lot of troubles with language, other people have a lot of troubles with memory, other people have troubles with um, mood or behavioral symptoms like um, depression or um, anxiety, or some people will develop uh, hallucinations or, or delusions where they believe things that aren't real. Um, I think of that as sometimes a reflection of being kind of cut off from the world in a sense, you know, from, from your senses. Um, but it, it's probably not that simple. So we really don't know why different people go, uh, you know, down different routes of progression. 
Um, but in general, I think most people with PCA, one thing you can say is most people with PCA are more aware of their uh, symptoms than many people with other kinds of dementia are. And so I think that they should be part of groups like this where we're including people in trying to understand their condition um, and, and, you know, involving them in, in all of the discussions in ways that, you know, might not typically be done with some people with Alzheimer's or other dementias where they don't realize they're having the kinds of problems they are. That being said, some people with PCA also um, have compromised insight or awareness into their problems, um, even though in general, I think many people have fairly preserved insight for at least for a while. So it tends to be overall, on average, a fairly slowly progressive condition. And I think the stages that I like to think about are um, you know, starting with this mild cognitive impairment stage when people are quite independent with a few exceptions of, um, you know, specific visual problems that affect their independence. And then sooner or later, people will move into a stage that I just like to refer to as a mild dementia stage where they really are dependent on another care partner or someone else uh, to help them with things like, you know, um, getting their meals um, and getting, you know, things done, really. Uh, and then there's a moderate dementia stage and a severe dementia stage. Uh, and those often take years to, to get through and to. Um, but the moderate stage is really where people are um, not able to really uh, participate in their own, um, you know, um, activities of daily living very easily. And sometimes that can be a problem uh, when people are still uh, able to sit and have a pretty re meaningful conversations. So it can be difficult to judge these stages because when people have PCA, they often lose their uh, sort of hand-eye coordination abilities to do basic activities of daily living like showering and, and um, toileting and, and eating at an earlier stage than a typical uh, person with other kind of dementia. So just because people have trouble with those things doesn't mean they're at a moderate stage of dementia. I often try to figure out, you know, how much are the, is the person able to engage in a meaningful conversation about um, life right now, you know, and if the, the person has lost uh, the ability to do activities of daily living independently, and they can't really have a very meaningful conversation about uh, the world around them or their life as it is now, that to me starts to get into what I would call a moderate stage of dementia. And often the visual symptoms are very prominent uh, throughout but the other symptoms come along and start to catch up a little bit. But the person is typically much more visually impaired than a person with regular Alzheimer's or another kind of dementia would be at the same level of function. And, and then there's a severe stage and, 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 you know, we can talk about that if we want to. Good. I just, I'm going to let other people ask questions, but do the treatments for, for that are traditionally used, the amyloid and the like tacrin and, and aricept, the, you know, memantine, do they work for PCA? Not very well. Um, I, I think we all use them uh, at some point in the process and we try to judge whether they're helpful or not. And it can be difficult to tell. Um, sometimes we just keep them going because we, we hope they're helpful, but we're not sure how to measure that. You know, in general, I think the standard treatments for Alzheimer's um, that include the three different, usually one of the three different um, cholinesterase inhibitor drugs, donepezil, um, uh, rivastigmine, and galantamine, uh, also known as Aricept, uh, Razadine, and Exelon. Those, you, you, usually we try to use one of those, uh, and then we usually try to use memantine at some point, and most patients can tolerate those, and it's hard to tell sometimes if they really help, but I think many of us believe that they may help people do better longer than they would be if they weren't on the drugs. Um, that doesn't mean they are, are producing improvements in function right now, but they might help people do better for longer over time, and it, almost as if you had slowed down the progression of the disease, even though there's no clear evidence that they do that, but they might help people maintain function for longer uh, than they would without them. We, we have no clear evidence for that, but I think many of us hope that that's what they do and that's why we use them, along with medicines to treat any other symptoms that we can identify, such as depression or, or other symptoms of that sort. Wonderful, I'm gonna, can somebody raise their hand and I'll unmute you if you have a question. Okay, um, 
on mute. Okay, go, Steve. Yes, uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, you talked a little bit about monitoring progression of the disease. Could you talk a little bit about ways of monitoring and uh, both through repeat imaging or just observation and what the benefit of monitoring progression would be in terms of possible treatment? Sure, yeah, I think um, monitoring progression is typically done um, at uh, a um, doctor or psychologist or or occupational therapist or other provider's office. I think we're starting to see some of this being done through telemedicine, uh, which we're piloting ourselves, uh, sort of like this. You know, I mean, I could do a fair bit of my interview with someone and my uh, neurologic exam on someone by just working with them through the computer. So I think we'll see more of that, especially for specialized conditions uh, like PCA. And so what that involves is essentially just taking a history, um, talking with the person and their, their family member about uh, the symptoms they're experiencing and trying to figure out if the symptoms that they had before are just a little worse or about the same. Uh, and if they've gotten, if they've developed any other symptoms that weren't present before. And so um, there's that part of it. And then there's the, um, uh, and, and some of that is just, you know, helping people understand things that they're experiencing. So some of what I try to do as I listen to the person's history, uh, reporting on what has happened to them over the last, you know, three or six months since I saw them, because we usually see people, you know, depending on everybody's schedules and the issues that the person is dealing with, um, every six months, sometimes we see them more often than that, if there are more active issues going on that would benefit from further uh, thinking. But in general, you know, the checkups are anywhere between once every three months or once every six months. Um, and they involve this history. And some of what we try to, many of us try to do when we're listening to the history is help the people telling us the history understand a little bit more about whether that's an expected issue in the context of PCA or not. Uh, and, and what it might, you know, mean in terms of brain function or in terms of uh, impact on daily life. And then uh, we do an examination of one uh, flavor or another that basically tests people's uh, neurological functioning, like you know their coordination, their vision, uh, their sense of their body. Because sometimes in PCA, people's sense of their own body, you know, if you close your eyes, you kind of know where most of the parts of your body are in space, and you could put on your clothes or do other things with your eyes closed. So you know, when a person is blind, they can do a lot based on their sense of their own body in space. Um, but with PCA, unfortunately, sometimes people lose some of that sense of their own body in space because that's really a parietal lobe function as well. And so it, it's almost worse than uh, a person who is visually compromised because of, you know, an eye problem because, uh, you know, if they close their eyes, they still can't figure out, you know, how to get their shirt on or whatever. So, um, you know, some of the neurologic exam is testing um, this kind of position sense uh, in people's bodies. And then the cognitive exam would be testing memory, language, visual function, um, so-called executive function. So, you know, we would often spend anywhere between half an hour and an hour with people every six months testing these kinds of functions and uh, also walking, you know, doing watching them walk and, and seeing how that's going uh, along with talking to the people about their symptoms and then try to put all that together to think about you know what else can we do to either help you understand the situation better or to try to uh, compensate for the problems that you're experiencing or to see if there are any medications or other therapies like occupational therapy that might be helpful to try to engage with uh, based on you know uh, your current condition so that's kind of the way I think of, of monitoring. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. And if I could ask one other question on a little bit different topic. Uh, because of the uh, impact on vision or the ability of the brain to process what the eyes are seeing, what, what 
is the level of understanding among ophthalmologists about PCA? And what would you say to someone who wears corrective lens lenses and goes to an ophthalmologist? Um, it, it, what, I mean, is there a benefit to um, doing refraction to try to improve vision acuity? Or is that, you know, something that, that really, you know, is not beneficial? Great question. Yeah, I mean, I think the understanding that ophthalmologists have of PCA is, is highly variable. Some of them know a fair bit about it. Most of them don't know much about it. Most of them have never seen a patient with it. Um, so I think most of the time the experience is very limited, if any. By or they've seen a patient with it, but didn't understand that that was going on, right? <laughs> yeah, that's very common, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, they don't always get the feedback later on uh, that that was what the patient had that they weren't sure about for a while, you know. So we always try to loop back to the ophthalmologists that people have seen in their journey with PCA after they've come to us and sort of, we, you know, we've ultimately figured it out because I think every opportunity uh, we take every opportunity to educate people, and that includes ourselves, you know, about all of this. So, you know, I think that some patients have uh, problems with vision that can be um, helped through uh, certain kinds of lenses, whether they're traditional prescription lenses or whether they're things like prism lenses. I think usually those don't help that much in my experience, but I think they're, it's usually worth a try, um, you know, and I think ultimately some combination of a, a, a neuro ophthalmologist or uh, and, and maybe a, um, a vision occupation a vision oriented occupational therapist if if any of those specialists are accessible in your area you know can help you determine whether um, vision correction of one sort or another is really likely um, going to be helpful we have another Thank question you. from Cecil hi Cecil hi I will I will beg you to mute me and un unmute me. I can't find it on the keyboard. Hi, I got symptoms. Okay, anyway. Uh, we're talking about a, a lot of stuff, and I, I don't want to get in the way of it, but we touched on uh, personal care and those things that folks that are struggling with symptoms uh, uh, are able to compensate and and find help for i got a lot of ser uh, help from services from the blind uh the um uh, six months of cane training right but uh the thing is I, I i i it took me a while to get some things back uh i've had symptoms since 2012 and then before uh but july of 2012 is when i got diagnosed uh I lost my ability to do calligraphy. I got it back uh, because if you have a horizon, the hand's still there and you can write. Same thing with quilting. I used to quilt. Uh, with some effort, I was able to get that back. Okay, it takes me an hour, hour and a half to thread a needle. <laughs> it can be done. <laughs> uh, the thing is, Okay, there's looking at it, being able to see it, and then getting it wrong. That and that's why, that, that's, yeah. So my question is, um, uh, wh when we talk about uh, this cognitive loss, right? And we talk about the hallucinations and uh, the, the, you know, the delusions, and so forth and so on. I'm starting to really experience this, okay? Yesterday, I crocheted a pair of slippers. <laughs> I, I went to pieces. Had to go to bed for four hours. It took me all the way, you know, and then three hours more to, to feel normal, and today I'm finally balanced out. What does that mean? It means I'm, I'm coming right up close and personal with having to find personal ways to deal with what I already know isn't right. Are there, are there any other, uh, 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 you know, therapies that, that might assist me through this, this, uh, and I see it as a change, 
but uh, I've been proactive. My background is special ed, so I get on top of it the quickest I can. But uh, from here, you know, I'm I'm noticing uh, this is a list. There's reading about it, and then there's going through it. <laughs> so, uh, are there any other are there any other therapies that I can get involved with that might help assist me through through this this period of real cognitive confusion? Yeah, I I, I think the um, kinds of therapies that may help people are are therapies that are focused on comp, uh, strategies to compensate along the lines that you're talking about. Uh, those tend to be offered by occupational therapists, uh, speech pathologists, uh, physical therapists, and uh, usually, you know, go beyond just, like an occupational therapist may actually work on cognition to some degree, because they're really interested in what things that you are trying to do, uh, are you still able to do, and how can you uh, possibly do those better, you know, and it may be that they try a bunch of stuff with you over time uh, and don't get anywhere, or it may be that they try strategies with you and together you figure out something that works more efficiently than the way you had been doing it before to accomplish the same goal. So I think in general, most of us in the field believe that those kinds of therapists are the best ones or, or therapists of that type in general are the best ones to uh, try to work with to um, accomplish the goals that you're talking about. And sometimes psychologists or neuropsychologists are also involved in this kind of work. It does vary to some degree by who happens to be in your local area and who you, who you learn about, which is, you know, another thing that I think everyone's trying to figure out how to make more efficient is how can you find out about the resources in your area in terms of expertise uh, that people might have in working with people with PCA. Yeah, Cecil, thank you so much. Where do you live, Cecil? Uh, end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Washington State. Okay, oh, they, we, actually have some, we actually have some people. I'll, I'll make sure we get in touch with you about that. But, um, yeah, this is, uh, this, this is coming to the forefront. Um, I, I'm doing all right. It's, it's just, uh, yeah. this is all new. Yes, of course. Any other questions out there? I know we're, we're kind of, yes, go ahead, David. Hi, David. How are you? Uh, the question I have, you, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. The question I have is about uh, mental exercises. Should we actually be trying that uh, and what do you recommend for that? In other words, I know visually you can't do puzzles and things like that, but is there things that we ought to be doing for Shirley as far as exercises in the mental area as far as memory goes? Because she's starting to get into the short-term memory loss and uh, her uh, finding you know, we tell her what year it is, like yesterday, and we ask her today, and she doesn't remember what year it is. So is there any kind of exercises we ought to be doing, and or should we get professional help with that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, both would probably be best, uh, meaning, you know, coming up with some of your own uh, exercises and uh, working with an occupational or uh, therapist or speech pathologist. Um, or psychologist, you know, I think um, the kinds of exercises that I believe are actually um, best to work on are, are not so much, you know, computer uh, training as it is uh, activities that are mentally stimulating that you can do with other people, like play games of various sorts or uh, talk about uh, either a book on tape or a, you know, uh, something that, that the person is able to enjoy, whether it's news or whether it's sports or whether it's, uh, you know, music or, or whatever it is. So I feel like the mental exercises that you get from hobbies and from social activities and uh, related kinds of activities uh, are really the best things for many people to do to try to kind of keep their mind sharp, if you will, you know, and, and I think that that to me is more effective, um, especially if the person is able to be engaged and active in doing the thing, uh, than trying to just go through these 
uh, memory games or other things like that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we, we send up? Yes, um, uh, yes. I don't see your name, but hello. Hi, Good. it's Michelle. Hi. How are you? I have a quick question. Those patients that experience like visual spatial issues, are, are they more, do they come and go like in more of episodes or is that something that they are symptomatic with all the time? Because my mom was recently diagnosed with PCA. So she's very early in the, in, in the stages. I mean, there's some days that she can see like a needle in a haystack from across the room, something that I wouldn't like say fell on the floor. Um, and then there's other days of something right in front of her and she doesn't see it. Yeah, it, it's a it's a great question. Um, you know, I think the types of symptoms that you're talking about uh, can be uh, pretty erratic in a sense. You know, so the, the one way to think about something like that um, is that when we look at at a scene in front of us, like imagine walking into a room with a bunch of people uh, that you're going to you know play cards with or something. Uh, you take in a lot of information pretty quickly uh, when mm -hmm. your brain is functioning normally. And what that means essentially is that your eyes are, are, are gazing in, in di to different targets in space and your mind is integrating all of that into a mental image, even though it seems like it's real to you, you know, but it's, it's coming into you from these segments almost. Uh, and sometimes people, for reasons I don't think any of us understand, sometimes people happen to their eyes happen to hit on the thing that is most important for them to be seeing at that moment. Uh, and then, you know, they know it. And the next time you do it, the person's eyes, you know, might not happen to hit on that thing that they're, you know, trying to take in and they miss it. So there can be some variability just uh, kind of as far as we understand it anyway, through chance in terms of where the person happens to look because the scanning that we would normally do with our eyes of a visual environment is also not um, doesn't function normally in many people with PCA. They don't they don't take in the information in the most efficient way. So it's almost like you could imagine kind of uh, looking through two uh, tubes and and you know having three three places where your gaze happens to go and that's all the information you get. And sometimes that's useful and some and gets you what you need and sometimes it's not. Um, so there's that issue. And then the other issue is that some people really do have what I would call true fluctuations uh, in the sense that they're lucid and on consistently today or this morning, and then they're uh -huh. off, you know, kind of consistently this afternoon or tomorrow. That's how oh, she is. Is that how she is? So it's a yeah. consistent pattern from day to day or with even within yeah. a day? Because sometimes I think it's me. I'm like, well, maybe I'm just kind of reading into things and things are fine. But then, you know, she's looking at her bag for her, you know, cell phone and it's not there, but it's right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that would be called what I, uh, what most of us would call a cognitive fluctuation, which um, sometimes uh, is, is uh, it's the, a typical feature of Lewy body dementia, um, which is, uh, um, you know, a, a different kind of dementia, but sometimes and it's, and it's another one of these terms that uh, puts together the clinical features and the pathological you know, disease in the brain. But sometimes people with PCA, uh, due to Alzheimer's, have these kinds of cognitive fluctuations that you see in Lewy body dementia. And other times, people with PCA with cognitive fluctuations turn out to actually have Lewy body disease as the cause of their condition in the brain. So, you know, it's a little bit complicated, and I don't know that we need to you know, try to understand it at that level. Um, but, yeah. but I think um, it's, a, it's a symptom that, that I think is fairly common um, and uh, would be a real symptom of the disease that we don't understand very well that somehow reflects changes in brain functioning. And I think the yeah. challenge, to me, the challenge of it is um, if the person has those lucid days, those days where they're more sharp, um, how can we maximize that? How can we access that more often? Is there a way to do that? You know, I don't think we really know, but it, it, uh, at least it gives me the hope that we'll be able to unlo unlock the secrets of those better days and find a way to, to help people do that more often. Um, but, you know, I don't think we're there yet. 
good. Dr. Dickerson, could you, I know you've got to get going now. Could you, do you, you do research there. If any, any one of our, our guests today want to know more about the research you do or want to sign up for the research that you're doing there, how could they do that? Absolutely. We welcome uh, everybody's involvement if they're interested. And I think um, the, the best thing to do would just be to send me an email and I'll pass it on to the appropriate member of our team. We're, we're trying to think about how to do research with people that aren't able to come here. Um, and so far, we haven't really developed a program of that sort, but we're, we're hoping to develop a program of that sort. For the most part, the, the research that we do um, requires that people come here in person and uh, in order to determine if that's worthwhile, we usually will talk with people and uh, try to obtain some of their medical records and, and, and find out a little bit more information about them to see if they might be a good match. And if they are, we can sometimes, um, you know, uh, pay for the travel involved. Uh, so we're, we would welcome people's uh, outreach and, and, you know, I applaud you all for being part of this group and thank you, Jamie, for facilitating it and, and we would love to connect with anyone that feels like they want to connect in any way and I, I, I think that if nothing else in this community we need to find ways to connect with each other and I appreciate the fact that you're making that happen here Jamie. Awesome thank you so much so Dr. Dickerson thank you thank you so much and anybody My who wants to get in touch with Dr. Dickerson please just email me through uh, the PCA support page or um, uh, on Facebook. So thank you. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Feel free to share my email with anyone, Jamie, and, and send me any message. And we'll, we'll, I'll ha answer it or I'll pass it along to the appropriate team member so we can get back to you because we'd love to, you know, be able to help in any way we can and, and partner with people in ways that would be useful. Wonderful. Thank you.